This is Flowgraph's example number three. Find h of z of a cascade system and then implement it as a direct form to Flowgraph. Let's consider a general approach to this problem. We have three system functions defined like this. The composite system function h of z is the cascade of these three defined subsystems. See so what that looks like. Each subsystem is a box. We have our primary input x of z entering at h1. Its output feeds the input of h2 and so forth until we have the primary output y of z emerging. The overall system function is h of z. Now with these subsystems in cascade, the system function overall is the product of the individual uh, system functions for each block. So we have h1 times h2 times h3. Now in part a we want to implement h of z as a cascade of three subsystems each implemented as a direct form to flow graph. h1 will have this general appearance because it's a first order function. h2 being a second order function would look like this and h3 is also a second order function. Because these systems or subsystems are in cascade we simply join them together to form the overall system. In part b we want to write the system function as a ratio of two polynomials. Now we know that h of z is the product of these individual system functions. You can write it out like this. And this amounts to multiplying out the polynomials. We just want to get this looking like one single polynomial of this form. And the same holds true for the denominator. We simply multiply these out until we get a single polynomial like this. Now in part c we want to implement this overall system function as a single direct form to flow graph. Well we identify the highest order denominator term and simply put down delay elements accordingly. So generally it will look like a structure that just gets longer in the vertical direction. All right let's move on to the detailed solution for part a. Here we want to implement each of the subsystems using direct form 2. This is a first order expression that requires a single delay element z inverse. Here I'm drawing the reverse coefficient path and here's the forward coefficient path. There's the input and the output. These are the, again, the forward coefficients. We identify these from the system function, and these are also known as the b coefficients. These are associated with the numerator. We start with the low order coefficient b0 and work our way up. b0 goes right here, and b1 goes right there. Put in the specific numerical values and we have 2 and 4. Now the reverse path coefficients, also known as the A coefficients, they require just a little bit more care to make sure you properly translate from the system function. This lead coefficient is always 1 and then we want to write the remaining coefficients as the sum of coefficients which are then negated before adding to 1. That means what we call the a1 coefficient would be positive 1 under this definition. So we would want to write down a unit value right here.
Let's move on to the next section. This is a second order section. That means we need two unit delays. Get the reverse coefficient structure going there. And our forward coefficient structure. This would be the output of that subsystem. And the input is fed directly by the previous stage. Our first forward coefficient is minus three. The next one is missing, it would be zero. Then the one after that is five. If you like, you can erase the arrow associated with the zero valued coefficient. All right, then we start with negative three and then we have negative four. Basically, we're translating the coefficients as we see them, but we do have to account for the way that they are defined. Again, the definition would look like this. It's 1 minus the quantity, minus 3z inverse, minus 4z uh, inverse squared. Now, h3 is a second-order system as well. Let me go ahead and put down the entire structure. Here you would have 3, 7, and 3 for the forward coefficients. We have unity minus 2 and positive 4. And this is our result for part A. In part B, we want to form the system function H and write it as a ratio of two polynomials. H is the product of H1, H2, and H3. Let me substitute in the specifics of each one of these. Now to get a single polynomial in the numerator, we need to multiply out these smaller polynomials. Let me begin with the first two. I'm applying polynomial multiplication. Here we would have 20 times z inverse cubed, and then we have 10 z inverse squared. Now here I have minus three times four z inverse. Notice that I'm skipping a z inverse term, so that's why I'm shifting this over two places instead of just one. Now we add column-wise. We have minus 6, minus 12z inverse, plus 10z inverse squared, plus 20z inverse cubed. All right, that takes care of the first two polynomials. Let's now multiply this result by the third polynomial. Give a little more room here. And yeah, we begin with 3 times 20, that would be 60 z inverse to the minus fifth, and so on. This would give us 140, etc. That gives us z inverse minus 4. Just trying to line these up so when I add column wise, I have the same powers of z inverse. All right, adding these columns up, we have this result. And that becomes the numerator polynomial. Apply the same process to the denominator, and you get this result. And that's what we needed for part B. This is our system function written out as a ratio of two polynomials. In part C, we want the direct form 2 implementation of the system function. We see that the highest order denominator term is 5, therefore we need 5 delay elements. I'll start by placing the forward coefficients. We start with minus 18, and then work our way up towards the highest order 
delay element. And let's turn now to the reverse coefficients. We would have the unit value showing up here. Then this would be our first reverse arrow. I'll go ahead and place the remaining arrows as well. This would be minus four. We need to remember to change the sign on each one of these as we label the coefficients on the arrows. And then we'd have 12 and minus 16. Let's go ahead and sum all of these together on both sides. Form the output and then add the input. All right, that's the result we need for part C. In part D, we want to compare to the cascade form from part A. Let's get that recalled from the past. And comparing these two structures that we know are equivalent from a mathematical standpoint, first thing we observe is that they have the same number of delay elements. That means that the amount of memory associated with delays is the same between the two. Next, we can consider the actual values of the coefficients. I see 170, and over here the largest one is only 5. Therefore, we see that more memory is going to be required for these larger coefficients. The other thing to note here is that we have a much wider dynamic range of the coefficients. Over here I see a range of 1 to 7, whereas on the direct form 2 structure we have 170. So we have much higher dynamic range. Lastly, as we look at this structure with this long chain of delay elements, that means we have a long chain of additions going back. These have much shorter chains of adders. That means we're more susceptible to finite precision effects, and that suggests that we are likely to have a less stable filter this way. All right, that wraps up this example.